Oh, hello there. I'm Matt from a different quantum timeline. I figured out the secret truth behind quantum mechanics, and I'm sending it to Matt in your timeline so he can tell you. Stand by. Listen to the world around you for a moment. What do you hear? Well, my voice, obviously. No doubt a sublime subjective experience, but only subjective. Outside your skull, that sound is nothing but an expanding series of density waves. Air molecules mindlessly bumping and shoving each other, oblivious to the complex wave structure that they propagate. And that sound wave itself can be deconstructed into an overlapping set of simple sinusoidal waves that move independently of each other in exactly the combination of frequencies and amplitudes to encode me talking about them. And there are other sounds, the background music, maybe your computer's fan, or the dishwasher, or the wind, birds, traffic. Each sound is its own configuration of overlapping sinusoidal waves. All these waves overlap to produce a fantastically complex bath of density fluctuations. A snapshot of particle positions in the room would reveal a hopeless scramble. And yet somehow your ear and your brain's audio processing network can pick out and focus on each individual sound. Everything I just described is real, but it's also an analogy for the quantum multiverse. A tenuous analogy, but bear with me. In a recent episode, I showed you how overlapping systems of ripples on a pond evolve independently of each other due to something called the superposition principle. This principle also applies to the wave function in quantum mechanics. In the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the universal wave function is the reality, encompassing all possible histories and futures, all of which exist. But we are only sensitive to a slice of the wave function corresponding to our world. And due to the superposition principle, our world can happily do its thing unperturbed by other parts of the wave functions, other ripples or worlds. It's as though you are only sensitive to one source of sound, say my voice, and your brain filtered out all the others. The presence of those other sound waves has no impact on how my voice propagates. Okay, cute analogy, but perhaps pointless because we don't even know if many worlds is right. There are other ways to interpret the math of quantum mechanics that don't require a multiverse. For example, there's the Copenhagen interpretation, which says that the wave function collapses at the point of measurement, leaving only one reality. Or de Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory, which says that particles are particles and waves are waves and the wave function's job is to shuttle real particles around, again leading to one reality. And there are quite a few other interpretations besides. But we are now approaching 100 years since the discovery of quantum mechanics and we still don't know which of these, if any, are right. So what's the holdup? A clue to the problem lies in the word interpretation. An interpretation of quantum mechanics is exactly that. It's a story about what's really happening behind the math. What physical mechanisms give rise to the equations of quantum mechanics. And the fact is, every prominent interpretation of quantum mechanics is perfectly consistent with the equation that lies at the heart of the theory. That's the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation describes how the wave function of a quantum system changes over space and time. And so it should completely determine the measurements we make of that quantum system. But if our observations are 100% determined by the Schrodinger equation, and all interpretations give the same Schrodinger equation, then how can any measurement ever tell between these interpretations? Well, it turns out there might be a way, but only if the Schrodinger equation is wrong. Well, not wrong, but incomplete. There are certain additional terms that we could add to the Schrodinger equation that may have such a tiny influence that we haven't noticed them before, but if they are real, they could allow us to distinguish between these interpretations. And much more than that, they could give us some pretty crazy science fiction powers. I'm talking faster than light communication, and even the ability to send messages between the worlds of the quantum multiverse, if it turns out that that actually exists. To understand all of this, let's first go back to sound waves. As we discussed in that previous episode, this ability for waves to pass through each other without being scrambled is due to the superposition principle. Let's dig a little deeper. This principle says that you can determine the evolution of multiple overlapping waves by calculating the evolution for each wave separately and then adding together the result. For that to be true, the medium carrying the wave has to behave in a particular way. 
whether that medium is air, water or the fabric of space-time itself, waves can happen in any elastic medium. Anything that tends to return to an equilibrium state after being stretched or displaced, because that can produce an oscillation, and in which adjacent points pull on each other, because that can cause the oscillation to travel. In the simplest imaginable case, the force that tries to bring a medium back to equilibrium is just proportional to the displacement at each point. That's the case for the most idealized oscillation, the simple harmonic oscillator. And that tends to be a good approximation for any elastic medium as long as the displacement is small. The restoring force of a simple harmonic oscillator is what we call linear, which just means that the output, the restoring force, is proportional to the input, the displacement. That's what allows two overlapping displacements to be treated independently. A linear restoring force leads to a linear wave equation, and a linear wave equation is what you need for the superposition principle to be satisfied. Now, in the physical world, the superposition principle only holds up to a point. Real pond surfaces or air density fields don't behave like simple harmonic oscillators if you try to change them by too much. Non-linearities creep in, which can do things like damp the waves, cause them to lose energy. But the Schrodinger equation, as we usually write it, is a perfectly linear equation. And in quantum mechanics, it's typically assumed that linearity and the superposition principle hold. Stack wave functions on top of each other, and they behave as though the others aren't there. This gives us a sense of why it seems impossible to test the many worlds hypothesis. Those other worlds, by definition, have no effect on our own. That's true as long as the Schrodinger equation is perfectly linear. But here's the rub. It turns out that if the Schrodinger equation has extra terms, however tiny, that are non-linear, then everything changes. Not only can we test quantum interpretations, but we can do some things that really should be impossible. It was the Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg who had the first insight. He realized that even a tiny deviation from linearity in the Schrodinger equation would add extra non-linear observables to the wave function. The normal linear observables are things like position, momentum, spin, the physical stuff that makes up our world. Extra observables would be non-local. They would exist across the entire wave function, and that in principle could give us a way to explore what happens to the wave function after measurement. Does it vanish as Copenhagen demands, or persist as many worlds would have us believe? Weinberg's fun little paper may have been overlooked if it hadn't caught the attention of another brilliant physicist, Joseph Polchinski. In a single 1991 paper, Polchinski showed how Weinberg's nonlinear observables would make it possible to achieve some pretty crazy science fiction effects. First, Polchinski showed that almost any nonlinear addition to the Schrodinger equation would mean that information could be sent between entangled pairs of particles. Now, we've been over entanglement before, but to remind you, if two particles are entangled, then their properties are correlated. By choosing how to measure one of the pair, you influence the state of its partner, essentially instantaneously and over any distance. However, the nature of this influence makes it impossible to send actual information this way. You can only detect that the influence happened by comparing the measurement statistics of multiple entangled pairs, and to do that, you need to send regular sub-light speed information. It's almost like the universe conspires to prevent any superluminal effects. But in exactly 11 lines of math, Polchinski shows that this conspiracy is delicate. Almost any deviation from perfect linearity in the Schrodinger equation would make it possible to send real information between entangled pairs of particles, enabling instant communication at any distance. And even backwards in time. Now, Polchinski doesn't actually tell us how to do this, he only proves that it should be possible in principle. But he was only getting started. He follows up by finding a way to write one nonlinear Schrodinger equation that does avoid this causality breaking prospect of faster than light communication. And it turns out that in doing so, he stumbles upon a way to communicate between the worlds of the quantum multiverse. And this time, he actually tells us how to do it, inventing what he calls the Everett Wheeler Telephone, after Hugh Everett, the guy who came up with the Many Worlds Interpretation, and John Archibald Wheeler, 
Everett's graduate advisor. Let me run you through it. We're going to use a Stern Gerlach device, something we've talked about a bunch. Basically, it's a pair of magnets, a north and a south pole, that deflects particles with spin and charge. It measures the direction of the spin by whether the particles are deflected to the north or south pole. Quantum particles will always be found to have a spin in the direction that you choose to align the magnets. So your choice affects the quantum wave function. Polchinski lays out the steps very clearly. You send a spin half particle like an electron through a stern gerlach device, and then you measure the direction of the spin. It has to be pointing either to the north or south poles, we'll call them up or down. In the many worlds interpretation, by making that measurement, you just split the world in two, and you split yourself. In one world, you measure spin down. We'll call that spin down you, you. In the other world, other you will measure spin up, and we'll call spin up you, other you. So now you will try to send a message to other you. First, you, but not other you, needs to inject some information into the electron's wave function. You'll do that by making a choice. Either you leave the electron with spin down, or you rotate it to spin up. After that, both U's send their version of the electron to some hypothetical and perhaps impossible device that subjects both branches of the electron wave function to a non-linear field. That field sort of spreads the local information from each branch, each world, through the entire electron wave function. Finally, the electron goes back through the stern gerlach device, and other U measures the spin once again. If you chose to rotate your electron from down to up, other U will find their electron rotated from up to down. But if you did nothing, other U will also find no change. You've now successfully transmitted a single bit of information between quantum timelines. Now, the real math behind this is quite a bit more complicated, but I've given you a sense of it. In order to build an actual telephone, you probably want to send more than a single bit. Unfortunately, you can't just use more electrons because every electron further splits the worlds, you'll just be sending a single bit to more use. Polchinski's idea really just serves as a proof of concept that in a non-linear quantum mechanics, actions can influence the entire wave function spanning different worlds. Perhaps real communication would be possible. However, there's one hard limitation. You can only talk to worlds created by the action of the telephone itself. I'm afraid that that world where you made all of those better decisions about your life remains forever out of reach. Okay, to summarize, either quantum mechanics is perfectly linear and you should forget I said anything, or it's non-linear and we can communicate instantly across any distance and back in time, or we can communicate across the branches of the quantum multiverse. According to Polchinski, exactly one and only one of those must be true. Perhaps then there's a me on a different timeline or in the future who's smart enough to figure all of this out and is now sending me a message. I guess he chose a different me. There are, after all, many worlds in the greater Everettian space-time. Before we get to comments, we wanted to let you know that if you're looking for a fun show for the young scientists in your lives, you should check out MegaWow on the PBS Kids YouTube channel. This show is designed to get kids excited about science through fun experiments. If you check it out, remember to tell them politely that Spacetime sent you. Last episode, we talked about this one very weird white dwarf star that scientists think may be the first observation of the result of the merger of two white dwarfs and how this may have huge implications for all of cosmology. Let's see what you had to say. Tom MS asks how that we can rule out that this white dwarf got its weird properties like its rapid rotation from being the result of a merger, rather than being a more usual white dwarf that accreted from a partner star before being ejected from that binary system. Okay, so Tom has a couple of good insights here. First is that a white dwarf could potentially gain a lot of angular momentum or spin by absorbing material from another star, hence perhaps explaining that high spin. And the second is that in order for that explanation to be valid, we'd need to know what happened to that other star. 
Let's turn to another comment by Awuma to help answer this. Awuma tells us that such rapidly rotating white dwarfs are found in post-common envelope close binary systems, the 471 Tauri with its 7 minute rotation being a good example. For those non-white dwarf astrophysicists out there, a common envelope binary system is one where the stars are so close together that they share an envelope. And you can also describe that as saying the white dwarf orbits inside the other star. Now, VC471 is a post-common envelope system, meaning that the white dwarf presumably ate up the surrounding envelope, in this case leaving behind a red dwarf. So this tells me that yes, you can greatly spin up a white dwarf by feeding it the envelope of its binary partner. But is there a way to then get rid of the rest of that partner? Well, one possibility is that the partner goes on to explode as a supernova, but the mass transfer onto the white dwarf actually makes this less likely because losing mass reduces the internal pressure, the fusion rate, etc. You can actually defuse a potential future supernova by sucking away its outer layers. The question then becomes, can you absorb just enough gas to spin up the white dwarf while still allowing the partner star to explode? Well, I'm not sure, but it seems that these scientists think that that's less likely than the white dwarf collision explanation, which at any rate we know must happen at least sometimes. Cyber Persona asks what happens to the star's magnetic fields after it goes supernova, and then guesses the correct answer. It dissipates into space with the matter, potentially leading to electromagnetic radiation. And that is exactly it. The supernova shock front is a mixture of high energy particles and magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields do lots of things, including accelerating particles to even higher energies. This is believed to be one source of the cosmic rays that reach the Earth. The magnetic fields then go on to add to the galaxy's magnetic field, and we see that field in many ways, including by watching the radio light emitted by electrons spiraling in that field, in what we call synchrotron radiation. Galactic magnetic fields have very clear bubble-like structures that come from past supernovae. Now, I started that episode with a mangled quote. Scientific progress is accompanied not by cries of Eureka, but instead by murmurs of, huh, that's weird. Vingador das Estrellas pointed out that the more common version is the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny, and attributed that to Isaac Asimov. Turns out the true origin is probably even more obscure. It appears first in the 1976 textbook introduction to The History of Mycology by G.C. Ainsworth, recounting Alexander Fleming's discovery of the bacteria-killing power of penicillin. Upon noticing the lysis of the staphylococci, his cry of Eureka was, that's funny. The Asimov attribution first appeared in Fortune, a random quote generator program in Unix. So a totally reliable source. Now I got the real answer to this from the quote investigator website, but not before spending way too long trying to find out. Now the real lesson here is don't get stuck down quote verification rabbit holes which apparently I'm never gonna learn. Of course, as Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Which by the way, is also a misattribution. That was in the 1981 book produced by Narcotics Anonymous. Damn it, see what I mean?